All right, let's get started. Welcome to the Out Loud LGBTQ podcast in conjunction with the Out Loud Anthology with Red or Green Books. Um, you have me and my host, Star Child. Say hey. Hello. Today we are interviewing Jacob R. Moses, author, poet, um, spoken word artist, um, a lot, actually. That list is very, very long. Um, we won't get into it today. Um, just some housekeeping. Um, again, this is with The Word is Right and Red or Green Books. We do ask that you follow us on YouTube. And also, for this podcast, follow us on Spotify. Um, your likes, shares, and comments um, go a long way for us. So we would appreciate that. Um, we've got our usuals in the room and some new how's everyone doing this morning or wow this afternoon doing great excellent awesome good good robert says mm, you know <laughs> like the mustache I like the clown face robert <laughs> goatee um and then we have our guest jacob R. moses how are you doing can't complain, Shaki. How are you doing? I am good. Before we jump into my questions, tell us a, a little bit about you. I know our, our guests pretty much know who you are. You used to uh, co-host with me on this show, um, right. but then, you know, life got in the way. But let's just get a recap on you and uh, what you've been doing. Okay. So I'm a poet and spoken word artist. I'm from Staten Island, New York. I just recently graduated with a master's of arts in English and creative writing with a concentration in poetry from Southern New Hampshire University. Very happy about that. Um, I am currently looking for work, currently peddling this book, Grimoire. Ooh. Hope it's showing correctly. Okay. It's backwards, so be it. But um yeah, uh basically I'm queer. I have my pronouns he, him, his, and uh yeah. That's about it. For now. All right. Um so my first question for everyone that comes in here. Um, what started this journey for you, um, your writing? And um, I know you've done different types of writing too, not just poetry, um, but what started this love for you? I think it always existed. I think my desire to express myself always existed. I haven't always felt like I've been able to communicate my thoughts through speaking them. So I did it through writing them. And it wasn't until September 12th, 2002, when I started performing at open mics on a regular basis, there was an open mic cafe called the Muddy Cup in Staten Island where I used to perform. And 20 years later, 22 years later, I've put out a number of books. I have performed at a number of different open mics around New York City. Additionally, I performed in Asbury Park, New Jersey and Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And it's been a wild ride. I mean, I think like as far as my origins are concerned, they're humble. They come from a very vulnerable place because I had always written poetry, but I hadn't always felt comfortable sharing it. So ultimately, it has been a real journey as far as finding my voice is concerned. I think that was the biggest drive for me when it came to writing was finding my voice. Would you say there was something that kind of nudged you um, to being more willing to to share um, share your poetry orally? And I'm I'm curious about the the date September twelfth. You know, with that, all that September 11th means in New York, and if that, you know, had anything to, to do with it. Oh, big time, big time. There were a lot of things about the post 9-11 world that I was dissenting against. And September 12th 
2002, a year and a day after 9-11, I had a lot that I had to say that wasn't being said. And the things that were not being expressed were the um, latent racism that was existing back then, the cause for unity when in reality we were not unified and we wondered, or at least I wondered, what does unity mean for the people who are touting it? Because amid these calls for unity and we shall overcome, there was a lot of bigotry happening against the Muslim population. And let's just be real here in America, when something bad happens to somebody who is in an underprivileged group, there are plenty of people who are going to seize that moment to persecute that group. And in reality, I had a lot to say about that. I had a lot to say about the phony patriotism that was encapsulating the masses. I was starting to see like red, white, and blue flags being used on cell phone advertisements. And it was just starting to become really ludicrous to me that we were living in such a jingoistic universe. And yeah, those were all the things I needed to call out at that. So, so it sounds like um, there was very much a political consciousness that was, you know, part of the core of you, uh, you know, finding your voice. Big time, big time. Human rights has always been something I've been passionate about. I went to my first protest rally when I was 18 and then Poetry just became my main modality when it came to protest. So um, you said you recently got your MFA. Congratulations. Yeah, um, MA. 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 Oh, I yeah. don't, okay, MA. Um, what's your, what are your next steps? I know you said you're looking for a job. What does the future look like for you? Currently, I'm looking for work as an instructor or a professor at a college or university. Before I got onto this interview, I was working on a syllabus that would be used for a future poetry course. I'm hoping that I'll be able to, with my experience, pass this two decade long wisdom onto the masses. I I'm really hoping that I can find something in academia because, you know, being an <laughs> author, being an author can only pay so many bills and with inflation in New York, that's minus one bills. You right. know. For sure. Um, so we are familiar with your collection grimoire. Um, but I, I know you said you had a movie or a documentary that you're working on. With our yes, co yes, yes. Doug Cavill, unfortunately, could not make it, but he is one of the cinematographers behind the documentary Grimoire Genesis of Jacob. And this is going to be a documentary that talks extensively about my beginnings in the poetry community, books that I've put out and just origin stories on how I started in the New York City community and, and expanded. I talk about how I started at the Muddy Cup in Staten Island, and then I go into what being a New York City poet has been about. And there's going to be footage that loosely documents the poetry scene in New York City. So it'll be an educational experience as well as a documentary on my life as a poet. And I should also mention that the director is um, a good friend of mine named Lou Alzamora. He's a bassist and he's a filmmaker and a writer. And it's amazing to me that he wanted to take this on. We had talked about taking on a project since, I want to say 2014. And 10 years later, here we are with this documentary and you know i'm 
more than happy to help fulfill this dream that we both had to work together. And Doug is a very good friend of mine. So, you know, we definitely knew that with his cinematography experience and editing experience, we wanted to have him on board. And he and I go back almost as long as I've been a poet. Um, I've been in the game for 22 years. He's on his 20th year as a poet this year. So, you know, we go way back. He's my boy. I love him, you know. Yes, yes. So you, you call yourself a New York City poet, which is interesting to me. Um, I was actually going to ask you about that. Um, you have the Five Borough Tour. Um, yes. That you've been on for the last few years. Do you see any want or need to expand outside of the five bureaus? A hundred percent. I think for the sake of doing this five borough book tour, I did want to get around to as many venues as possible being a New York City poet. But yeah, I, I would love to perform around the country. I mean, thankfully, I was able to get a gig in Asbury Park, New Jersey for the Coffee and Words open mic at the Asbury Park Roastery. And uh, Cord Moreski was the host, amazing man, amazing poet, amazing, just human altogether. And I performed in December of 2022 that year. 2022? Yeah, 2022, yeah. And I also performed in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania at the uh, Barnes and Noble over there very convenient to get to right off the expressway and right off the highway and uh, it was amazing and i definitely love to do a lot more features around the country for certain traveling is definitely something that i value a lot and getting my words around is definitely something that i've been more inclined to do yes uh, it's definitely difficult as someone who's been trying to do it myself. It is definitely difficult. Um, so I'm happy I have people like you to see how you are framing uh, framing that. Oh, um, thank you. For that. Thank you for that. So one of the first things you said when I said for you to introduce yourself was I'm queer, right? Which on the show we do delve into queerness and other forms of that um, on the show. Um, sure. How has your sexuality framed the projects that you work on, um, the pieces that you write, so on and so forth? Oh, that's a good question. Very good question. It wasn't until 2016 when I came out with the book Tobias. And Tobias was a product of the Pulse nightclub shootings. I started to get a little bit more involved in my faith, and my spirituality as a Jewish person. And all I know is that when I read the subtext of the six poems that I put in that book, a lot of it did relate to some of the things that go along with struggling with one's sexuality, feeling a sense of belonging, feeling a sense of humanity, feeling a sense of acceptance these have been things that have been mainstays in my work and whether i was in the closet or out of the closet while i was writing and i was both when i was a poet throughout the entire duration that i've been a poet it's been liberating to be able to relay certain messages that come along with being queer and certain experiences that come along with being queer and insights on different elements of life and different elements of society. Poetry has always been the liberating element of that. Since you mentioned spirituality, um, that's something I'm always interested in is kind of the intersection of queerness in spirituality and just kind of, um, you know, I feel like in a lot of ways, um, you know, my my queerness shapes my spirituality. I, you know, I come from a, a more Christian background, but I always mm -hmm. tell people I'm a, I'm a queer Christian, which is very different than a lot of other types of Christian. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in this kind of the, 
the intersection between queerness and Judaism. And if I don't know if you have um, thoughts about that or just how the how the queerness and, and the spirituality kind of um, intermingle. Hmm. I think that, you know, it's interesting. I kind of have a little bit of an anecdote about that, which is, you know, I have a friend who is a queer creative making a cartoon about a camp where everybody is queer and when you're queer you automatically have superpowers or like magical abilities that you can own so i feel like there is a certain level of magic in a sense that does come along with being queer because Queer people, we have insight that a lot of people may not necessarily see. We see nuances that many will take for granted. And I think that in and of itself is a spiritual message that a lot of us get early on. We understand the need to have compassion for other people because we don't always feel like we're in places where we get that compassion. We don't always feel that sense of safety. And so I think spirituality is oftentimes in the queer community been something that has sustained us. It has kept us going. It has allowed us to really own our power in a world that oftentimes does not value us. And so I feel that, I, I genuinely feel that queerness does have a sense of magic realism about it, I think. It's generally where I come from with that. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely vibe with that. And, you know, just like, just like you're talking about the nuances and, um, you know, I feel like in the mystical path, you know, it's like all about getting beyond the, you know, the binaries and um, you know, just oversimplifications of, you know, morality and um, that that get in the way of, of a more authentic spirituality. And um, yeah, and I also like, like I, I I kind of see a sense of like I wonder if you would identify um you know just with the the political activism you've done and um you know kind of w along with the spirituality and queerness if, if there's a sense of the prophetic you know like within that oh boy i am so glad you asked me that question because i have had many prophecies <laughs> many of them not to toot my own horn and I hate bragging about this but I did foresee the insurrection um, I had done a tarot card reading about the election the 2020 election and that's Grady and those are fireworks going off in the background it's just the Pro Bowl guys anyway <laughs> Um, <laughs> I'll wait. Shut up. <laughs> hear it. Yeah, we hear. We yeah. We I I hear fireworks in the background, and I'm just thinking of myself. Okay, so yeah, I I had done a tower card reading online on uh, Facebook Live, and I had seen the tower, and the tower is like the doom and gloom card of. The deck and all i know is i just had this prophecy that there was going to be something really bad that was going to happen regardless of whoever got elected and low-key i was predicting biden but i didn't like say who i was predicting i just said some bad is gonna go down and so i've had prophecies like that i've also had a prophecy where I was walking down my neighborhood and it looked like it was an execution march. The only difference is that they weren't carrying a noose, they were carrying a big slinky. And I'm like, looking at this and I'm like, okay, close enough. 
I do have prophecies like that. And I don't know if I attribute that to my queerness by any means, but at the same time, I am that attuned to things. I am that attuned to moods. I am that attuned to vibes in which, in which it seems as if I'm getting the spoilers for the news. You know what I'm saying? That's what it, that's what psychicness feels like to me. Like I'm getting news spoilers. Yeah. Well. Um, so. So that that makes me really curious about. I don't know your thoughts about, just, what, I don't know what the what the hell is coming next. You know, <laughs> like, like I'm just. Yeah, I feel like. I feel like every year, like I'm like, oh my god, it's 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 only going to get worse, you know. <laughs> but I'm hoping that yeah, there's like, it's going to get I've better been, after it gets worse yeah. or something. I've been thinking that. I mean, I've been kind of quiet on that front because there's just too much to comment on, and I've just been like low on bandwidth beyond all flipping belief, you know. <laughs> So, as far as this is concerned, I mean, we're basically just waiting to see what's going to happen. I mean, it seems almost as if it's just like a race to the grave. It just seems. It's just sad to me. It's just absolutely sad to me. I mean, putting other issues aside, I'm very fearful of another Trump presidency. Very fearful of it. And it just makes me wonder how so many people can be so adherent to their spirituality and yet at the same time excuse so much that is antithetical to their values. I think when it comes to spirituality, that's the thing I'm grappling with the most to you know social issues how can people excuse this so with both questions you kind of got into how your writing is very liberating your spirituality allows you to be liberated um yeah. and to you know be a, a, on a higher um plane we'll say. plane yeah just so to speak um, I notice you have mentioned that you use a pseudonym for your writing. Are all of your writings under that pseudonym? There are many writings that are going to be found under my real name, Jack M. Friedman. Friedman spelled F R E E D M A N. What was the reason for the pseudonym? Was that due to your queerness, or what was? It was due to me needing to take on a different identity after going through uh, detox. I had actually deleted a Facebook account with my real name after 12 years of using it. And I just thought to myself, you know what? I got a, I got a clean house because there were a lot of things that I said that were kind of crazy. And I was probably really inebriated when I said them. <laughs> so I just wanted to get rid of that. And uh, long story short, this April, I will be five years clean from Xanax. Which, congrats, uh, congrats. And uh, that it was a product of that. It was a product of my uh, clean time that I had wanted to go by a pseudonym. I had wanted to go by a pseudonym for some time. And Jacob Moses was one that kind of came up for me numerous times because that's my Hebrew name. When I wound up publishing three chapbooks under the name Jacob Moses, I saw there was another author with that name. And so I adopted the R, which stands for Reuben. And Reuben is my father's Hebrew name. His real name was Reginald Friedman. And so I decided to throw the R in there to honor my father. Being Jewish, we are very firm believers of honoring our ancestry. So I decided to take on that student, part of my pseudonym there. Well, um, I do have more questions for you, but we're going to get a little bit more on the light side. Before we do that, <clears throat> um, I did want you, we spoke about you featuring your work. Uh, um, <clears throat> are you okay with giving us maybe like 10 minutes worth of a feature or just reading a few pieces? 
Yeah, I can do that. All I right. Let me do that. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, I'll do something from Grimoire. It is one of the pieces in here that is queer themed. I think I may have touched upon it in other poems, but this is the most, this is the most explicit one when it comes to the theme of homosexuality. And this is called Kings of the Castle. Embrace our common ground, love, as we lay under the branches of a willow tree, evolving, knowing what will be, will be. Only these instincts are what we obey. My heart alone, it needs a harbinger, one who can love me when I'm my worst fiend. Within our glance, I hope this time won't end. We whisper as we hold each other near. Ignore these forces, those which interdict. We seek refuge, a tent formed by each wing. Though we're the monarchs, we will not be strict. We know in the end we'll marry a king. Your head on my chest as I stroke your hair. We will collectively maintain our lair. That's one. The next one I'm going to do is one that does touch upon the addiction thing that I mentioned before, and this is called the percussion of Xanax. Before attempting to write, I envision typing with my right hand and holding a bottle of Xanax with the left. I wanted to see if the collisions of pills within this marmalade bottle could provide the backbeat to a backdrop of dim lights and rodents. And whether I'd be that beatnik in a state of panic who could write through the rattling of these tablets against this plastic or the bongos reverberating relentlessly and the acoustically gifted parts of my brain is uncertain when I just need to get some sleep. I've been in positions where my first instinct was not to write while holding a controlled substance like a baby on mother's nipple. The first trauma in infant experiences is the disconnection of the umbilical cord after being welcomed into the world and whether my solar plexus healed is one thing. But have benzos been my milk this whole time? I'm going to do two more, It'll be short. So the next one that I'm gonna do is called Lottery. This is one that I'm hoping to have in another collection that um, I'm currently workshopping with publishers called Answer Key. My mental health is a lottery. Stability is a daily game of chance. Unknown as to whether this bingo cage will release my exhausted survival skills or my self-destructive behavior. 80 emotions contained in one heart, six moods released from one brain, shuffling like the wind inside a glass sphere, sometimes spinning like a centrifuge. My precious energy is hyperactive and preparing for an outburst of ear-shattering screams. Too much pressure to appear stable after emotions are released. Every day is an act of gambling where I could experience combinations of simple emotions, creating a complex inside a withered spirit. All these bouncing balls have the impact of my inner child jumping upon my back like an inflatable surface at a birthday party. I'm getting too old to appear stable to all who eventually get to know me. I do not fear violence from my enemies. I fear my mind far worse than any gangster, and my only supplemental number comes from the phone from which I call the man who sells me weed, for sometimes all it takes to soothe me is a dime bag and a lucid dream. It's my last one. 
And this is called Overlooked. This is new sure. <clears throat> Tried to find an oasis in which I irrigated tears, and all I found was anger eroding my judgment. Mistrust amid the mornings where my insecurities to shooters and my shivering subconscious inebriated every sunrise until I lightened the darkness with milk and sugar, and even then... I am still hollow. Sundown creeps around my window with sadness, directs the traffic swerving around my inadequacy, concluding the night by aligning five green squares in the hopes that maybe I still have a way with words. But it's only now that they come to me, and only now that I am accepting ebbing and flowing of instability, flotsam and jetsam of disability. I've attended more funerals than I ever danced at weddings, and not even electric shocks can make profound trauma a slide shuffling around hallways and stairwells and tunnels will bring me back to a thick fog where i thought i'd find love i am not okay with pretending to be okay at every bloody moment and i deplore the normalcy that comes with the pressure of hiding i am always hiding while i am seeking i am always seeking to find myself i am always found somewhere i am always where you last looked. Thank you. Wonderful pieces. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for giving us that new shit. <laughs> yeah, so I love the, the visceral. Uh, I'm sorry. I love the visceral imagery in your work. Like it's it's just so sensual. Um, you know, um, we really appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Star Child. All right. So, um, tell us where we can get copies of your work or find your work. Okay. So I have a website, poetryofjacobmoses.com. I also have a grimoire is available on Amazon and Barnes Noble and all online book retailers. It's also made ready to order at many independent bookstores since it is on Ingram. Feel free to tell your local shops to carry grimoire. Peace. <laughs> nice, nice. All right. So we're just going to have a little bit of fun. Okay. Like so that. you're stranded on an island. You're not allowed to have a boat. You can't say a boat or anything like that because that's just obvious. Uh, okay. Got food and water. What are three things you need on that island to survive? Music. Definitely music is the big one. I mean, look, if I could have, like, I don't know. If I could have, like, a three-piece band, that would probably be the thing that I would bring. But no, I mean, definitely some form of canned music I would need. I would also need um, a pen and paper. So it's my eye, music pen and paper. At least that'll give me a reason to zen out before somebody tries to rescue my behind. Okay, okay. Peanut butter or jelly? Okay. Oh, I, oh, with the baseball bat? I don't know. <laughs> it's a question. Peanut butter or jelly? Jelly. Jelly? Harry Styles or Sam Smith? Harry Styles. Oh. All right. So Harry Styles is winning. Um, Harry Styles or Mario Lopez? Harry Styles. Are you a fan of his? I am. Oh, I would not. Have, I would not have guessed that. I didn't think that. <laughs> um, Harry Styles versus Joe Jonas. Wow. You know what? I'm going to go three for three on that, Harry. Harry. Hmm. Somebody else throw someone out. We got to get Harry out of here. <laughs> Uh, 
trying to think of attractive men as a lesbian this is a little bit hard um hmm harry styles or idris alba Wow. I I have two. Uh, two men. Alec Baldwin uh -huh. or Zach Efron. Zach. So the reason why I picked they were a hairy man, older, and a smooth man, younger. That's funny. I would pick Alec Baldwin. <laughs> Um, wow. What is something we did not ask you about that you would, you wish we had asked you about? Hmm. Well, I mean, one thing that I'll talk about, which I don't really talk about that openly is, um, along with being a queer, there's also the fact that I'm a queer parent. I have an adult son. He's going to be 21 this year. So um, that I'm happy about. And he's also creative, which really does make a big difference in my life. I mean, it really is beautiful that I have a son who is as talented of an artist as he is. And uh, he's been involved with certain projects that I've been involved with. I did put together an anthology called the revolution and he has a sketch of garnet from well a more lifelike version of garnet from steven universe in there so I like garnet I like garnet yeah steven universe I, I think it's funny he gets all the it, that show gets so much like glow now because like back in the day like people didn't like it like i got picked on for like in steven universe and like now everyone's like oh steven universe um yeah. Yeah, I think I think Owen was into it. I mean, when it came to that whole block on uh on Cartoon Network, I know that he liked Steven Universe, he liked um Gumball. And then my personal favorite, regular show. Yes, I love that one too. <laughs> regular show. Whoa. <laughs> Yeah. So our child is now comfy. Are you sleeping? Better wake up. I'm awake. Oh. <laughs> I think when I sometimes when I hold the phone this way, like it looks like my eyes are closed, but I'm just chilling on my couch. Right. Another, another toss up for you. Throw it San, Fr San Francisco or Provincetown? San Francisco. The Golden Gate Bridge kind of tipped me off as far as that was concerned. <laughs> so what uh, What about if we go international? Um, what would be your, your favorite international city to visit? Changes so often. It really does, but... I mean, at one point it was Amsterdam because, well, it wasn't legal in New York at that point. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Rio was another one. Um, certain ones are out. I mean, I've been to Jerusalem. I'd like to go back, but I ain't going back no time soon. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> uh, and Moscow was another one. Yeah, that one's definitely out. Uh that leaves Paris. I've always wanted to go to Paris. Yeah. I feel like, you know, that's like every poet's dream. It seems like such a cliched thing, but internationally, France is one of the first places where I was published. Oh. I've been published in the UK numerous times, but Paris, I was published in a magazine called Post Blank. And um, it's no longer in print, but I've been in every single issue under Jack Friedman. And I've had poetry in there. I've had art in there. And uh, probably one of the most notable things that I have is a poem called The Bong That Never Ends. And it's written in the shape of a bong. Hmm. It's a concrete poem in the shape of a bong. I've written many concrete poems. I've written them in the shape of a bong, in the shape of a coffee cup, in the shape of a penis. You know, I've done it in a number of different 
things. The last one has yet to be published, so that's that's just kind of being kept under wraps until that winds up actually getting into print, which... The penis one? Yeah. yeah. Nice. Good luck that's with that. That's something Robert Fleming would do. <laughs> Robert, you got any leads, bro? <laughs> I can tell you a list of magazines that have rejected uh, visual images with frontal nudity. I, so I can tell you all the places you shouldn't submit to. Not to submit to. <laughs> well, I found one place where I did submit to, low-key. So. Yeah, so that being said, um, yeah, somehow, I mean, you just never know. Sometimes it's just like with international journals, they do get less prudish about that sort of thing. So in this case, this was a poem that was written about um, the floppy disk. And uh, basically, you know, it's just a little bit of a, just kind of like a lascivious poem that's called Over Five Inches. <laughs> and it talks about the five and a quarter inch floppy disk while being written in the shape of a penis. Creative, creative. All right. So <clears throat> if you have the chance, um, I, and I know that there's kind of this pre and post you um, before the um, addiction and then after, if you could go back further than that to Little Jack running yes. around Staten Island, what yes. is something that you would say to Little Jack? Stand up for yourself more. Mm. Develop your voice. Actively develop your voice every single day. I actually did not start speaking until I was about three years old. Mm. So I had speech delays. And a lot of people would never guess that I have speech delays given, given the way I speak, given my way with words. But I've had that issue for a while mm -hmm. and it took me a while to really develop my voice and having been a spoken word artist for over 20 years I think I've really developed it a lot I've really mastered it but there's always more to master and that's the one thing I always keep in mind there's always more to master there's always another challenge to look forward to in life and I'm just so happy that I've risen to so many of those occasions and ultimately I just want to tell my younger self to just keep going, sail on sailor and all that. I think that's a beautiful message. And I think that it shows in your work, the whole stand up, um, because you do stand up for different peoples and communities in the pieces that you write. So um, I definitely see that echoing through the pieces that you have. Um, Aside from Little Jack, what would you say to someone who's starting out as a spoken word artist? What are some tips you would give them to help them be successful? I think definitely take in the environment of the open mic. You know, sit down for a little bit, just absorb everything. And if you are courageous enough to go up, more power to you. I think the first tip that I will give any poet who is going up for the first time, announce that it is your first time. Always announce it is your first time getting up at the mic. Because poetry open mics are meant to be safer spaces now, you know, because, you know, we do ensure the safety of everybody around us at these open mics. We want to make sure that the newcomer is as safe as possible. And Having been in the rooms of N.A. also, you know, there is such an encouragement that comes along with being as hospitable to newcomers and making as good of an impression as possible. And all I know is that I've mentored numerous people. I've given my feedback. I've not only that, but I've really formed 
long lasting bonds and Doug Cava being one of them, the like my OG protege, you know. But he's a contemporary now and you know, I just I just love him for that. I've just like loved this, just like the way that he's really shown through because you know, as someone who's been in the scene for almost as long as I have and you know, there are so many different ways in which I have seen people grow and I've encouraged people and I've seen people just flourish in ways other than poetically. Um, sidebar, I used to be involved in Toastmasters. I was a public speaker training to one day get that TED Talk and I've mentored people in public speaking as well. So I hope people in such a warm regard you know really hold everybody in that such in such a warm regard there yes <clears throat> the ted talk is on my my to-do list but i need some practice before we get there <laughs> um i used to coach people so. um so yeah um star child do you have anything else for jacob Yeah, uh, well, uh, not specifically, but uh, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love to hear if you have any, any encore poems that you'd like to share, um, then I would, I would love to hear more of your work, if that's gladly, possible. Gladly, gladly. I love encores. I do. <clears throat> I'm going to do a poem that I just realized I had memorized. In fact, you know, I have two um I have two signature pieces that I regularly regularly perform. I had three of them, one of them I've recently retired, but this is like my new favorite. It recently got published in the New Generation Beats anthology of 2023 and this is called Palace Amusements. Asbury Park greets me within your thin-lipped, toothy smile. At the end of every labyrinth, you straddle the seashores yen. You are a funhouse mirror distorting my figure, yet always finding abundant embodiment within my gut. My navel yearns for that amusement within these vibrant walls. Love was the product of jackpots won from slot machines, dispensing ducats, tokens tossed from one hand, arm pulled by the other hand. You were the windfall stashed within this chest of hazy nostalgia. Adulthood proves more haunting compared to the cart carrying me through those mysterious halls. Wishing I could be hypnotized just so I could catch a spoonful of what once satiated my satisfaction. One taste of the sacrament derived from riding the roller coaster before it became a cliche denoting a diagnosis. Before mania surged through my synapses like a Jimi Hendrix guitar solo. After bumper cars foreshadowed the accidents I'd face throughout these static frequencies of depression. If you were a Eucharist, I'd be an idolater. For you were the body of a god I tasted before knowing when it meant to be a righteous Jew. You were the re excuse I needed to play hooky from a Sunday school. You were the choir who greeted me before I pos possessed the voice to echo any calls I desperately needed to answer. You were the calming voice I needed before my own soothsaying emerged. Now the tongue with which I speak needs to taste the honey into which I dip my apple. Now this fruit stores nectar of passing years in a cloud, accessed via my digital thumbprint, repressed via my carbon footprint. Pollen is carried by a generation of workers and drones. If I left Left an intention on my doorstep, I'd wish for it to be carried by the westerly wind. I'd hope the corners of the crown in my castle mirrored this palace of amusements. I pray the pleasantries could be contained from within the channels from which we feel joy. May our data be easy to transmit, even if our devices are outdated. May said devices be reused as analog anecdotes. Let them be paperweights for the childhoods we cherish, preserving a trail back to the inner offspring struggling to spawn and survive. Wow. Yeah. Really? Rock on any black. Okay. Um, yeah, 
Yes, thank you for that encore. Uh, when's the movie coming out? Uh, that has yet to be determined. You know, it is in the very, 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 very final stages of post production. We plan on doing a private screening soon, and we're hoping to do some good things with it. We really are. Uh, we definitely intend to have it streaming on uh, on YouTube. You know, we're definitely going to do the YouTube Vimeo channels, Vimeo. And uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to get it on streaming platforms also. So look out for Grimoire Genesis of Jacob. Also, I got to give a special shout out to Tony Langhorn, Kyoko Hashimu, and Michelle M. Antoine, who are all in the documentary as well. Also, another shout out to Douglas G. Kara, who's the chief cinematographer, and Lou Alzamora, the director. Also got to give a shout out to Carissa Pignatelli, who is the voice, the narrator of this documentary. Yeah, we got a narrator and we got a green screen. We fancy like that. <laughs> fancy smancy. All enough. right. Well, we are coming to the end of our hour. Uh, Jacob, it is uh, a pleasure to have had you on. Um, come back and we'll talk about what you, you got going on. I wish the best for you. Um, I hope everyone listening that you go on Amazon and get a copy of Grimoire um, so that we can support the poet. Um, let's support poets, right? Um, while we're still living. While, while they're still with you. That's, ain't that a line? Yeah. You said you don't want to be you don't want to be Poe, all right? As in Edgar Allen. All right. right. Mm. And uh, Jacob is also in our Out Loud um, anthology um, under his uh, pseudonym, uh, Jacob R. Moses. So please go to Rudder Green Books and get your copy of the Out Loud anthology, um, highlighting different queer poets um, in the community as well. Um, and we will continue to highlight queer poets here on the Out Loud podcast. Myself, Douglas Kayla, and Star Child. Da -da -da. So, um, like I said, like, follow, share on all different media platforms, especially on Spotify. Um, it's not monetized. I know it seems like it is because I keep saying go go to it. Um, but as of right now, it's not monetized. So, you know, just go like, follow, share. Even if you don't listen to the whole thing, listen to Jacob's feature. It was amazing. What can I say? And it's free. Okay, get it while it's free because he's gonna be worth money someday. We all are. Okay? Yeah. Facts. Facts. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jacob. Yes, I'm gonna end the recording. Thank you so much.